Kick it. Jerry Bertoman is with Bug Labs, and Bug Labs has one of the most fascinating exhibits here at the Sands at uh, CES 2008. Uh, one of my listeners had actually sent me a YouTube of uh, your product, and I was, I was looking at that, and I wish someone had the camera on when I finally realized it was you guys, because uh, this, is, this is really exciting. What, what is it that you have so that we can orient people on Bug Labs? No problem. So um, what I'm holding here is kind of the heart of the system. This is called the bug base. And the easiest way to think about the company is think of the you know, Lego for gadgets, okay? Or someone else called this like modern heath kit. So this is the bug base, and this is a microcomputer. This is about as powerful as a two or three year old laptop used to be, all right? So um, it's an embedded system, it's got USB, it's got MMC adapters, ethernet power, lots of stuff, Wi-Fi. Um, it's got a battery built in. 128 megs of RAM, and this is the brains of the operation. And the idea here is that there's lots of inventors out there, there's lots of tinkers, there's lots of entrepreneurs, there's lots of hobbyists. People want to do stuff. And we look at today, you know, we're democratizing everything, blogging, media, etc. Why not gadgets? Right? Everybody else here at the show is shit selling you the gadgets they've already built. We're instead putting the power in your hands to build the gadget you want. So for example, I can grab an LCD screen lock it onto the system, and now I've got just a portable device with an LCD, LCD screen. I could use this as a PDA, I could do anything I want with it. I could add a five megapixel camera to it. Now I've got a digital camera, take a picture of myself, you know, post it straight to Flickr, who knows what I want to do with it. Or I can add a motion detector to it. And now I put this in my house, and I've got an open source home automation system that whenever someone walks in, the, walks in front of my window, it takes a picture and sends it to my cell phone. Mm. Right? The, the combinations are you know, virtually limitless. Um, we've, we've got a list of 80 different modules in our conception. This one's GPS, uh, game controller, barcode reader, laser finder, weather module. I mean, the list is endless. So how much of a guru do you have to be to be able to script this stuff and to get it all talking from one part to the other? That's a great question. Right now, you pretty much have to be a programmer. If you're a Java coder, you know we've got a full SDK. It actually is a drag and drop kind of environment. It works in a way like iTunes. Today, you know, if someone wants to build an application that interfaces the bug to Flickr, they can do that. They post it live to our community called Bugnet. Then someone else can come along. Once they've hooked their bug up to their computer, they can drag and drop the applications they want. They don't have to code anything. So as the developer community starts building more and more cool functions, a regular person can just come on board, see something they like, they want the home automation system, drag and drop it, buy the bug, off they go. So that module then, it's, it's, it's kind of the, the benefits of the community that start to build the capabilities of the system, and the more people that participate, the more capability, okay. it's this virtual cycle that, that's going. That's exactly right. We actually use the term, instead of saying CE for consumer electronics, we say community electronics. So the idea is that as we have more and more people involved, it gets better and better. If you think about uh, WordPress, for example, when WordPress started, you had to be fairly technically minded to blog. Today, you can go to WordPress.com, you can point and click, pick the theme you want, you can add your plugins to Twitter or Flickr, or whatever you want, it takes almost no effort. Right? We see the same cycle going to happen with Bug, where today, people need to code a bit. In the future, they just can drag and drop whatever they want. What's been your biggest challenge in bringing the bug modules to market? Because you know, there's lots and lots of ideas, sure. and you know, you've got 80 suggestions. How do you decide which are the six modules that you start with, and then the next 10? Okay, it's a great question. So, the way we figure out the modules really is kind of the most commonly used. So we decided that an LCD screen helps all sorts of gadgets. Um, a camera opens up lots of possibilities. 
GPS also, there's a lot of, you know, people are really excited about GPS today. The problem is every GPS system out there is totally closed, right? You can't, you know, if you've got a better route to get from your home to the freeway, you can't program that into your GPS unit, right? You can't adapt it, right? Here you can. So we try to start with, with very, I don't want to use the term generic, but common, commonly used functions. But what's happening now is we're actually opening up our community to the outside world so that there will be um, kind of like how DIG works, where you can come to the site, suggest your own module, the community can debate it, vote on it, suggest new ones, and we're going to use the power of the community to determine the roadmap. So we'll work with them to prioritize. So, so do you have an obligation, if you've developed uh, taking these modules and developed uh, the programming to, to glue them together, do you have an obligation then to, to make that open source back into the community so that others can take advantage? Or can this be used as a building block for development of proprietary, what eventually might become proprietary products? So everything we do is open source and GPL. So for example, we have an MMC card with a lot, which a few people question, how come not SD? SD is a closed proprietary format. We wanted everything to be open. So that's our core. Now if you come along and you write a really cool home automation system, you can charge money for that software. You are not obligated to anybody for anything. If you take uh, our drivers and recode them, the GPL will bind you to bringing that back to the community. So um, we see that things that are kind of at a contributory level are, are community owned, but end applications, heck, you could build, if you want to build like a scavenger hunt game, you should be allowed to charge for that, go for it. Or in your GPS example, instead of taking the freeway or the scenic route, and those are the only two choices you have, uh, you may have a situation where you know kids need to go to a certain place uh, on Wednesdays, but then on Fridays a different different route is is involved. Exactly. I mean, you know, we we actually try not to figure out too many end scenarios. We we're really about enabling imagination. We really want you know, if you think about computing back like in the 70s and 80s, you know, you had to be a little creative to make things work. Today, everything just works. You buy a laptop, it works, right? So we want to bring that same spirit of tinkering back into the hardware world, where you know, you've got well over two million software programmers out there today. Their world is limited to software. You've got a computer, you write code, you write a website, which is great. But you know, the barriers to working in hardware are so high that it's daunting. We want to drop those barriers down completely. So even if you don't have a commercial purpose, you just want to play, right? This is a new toy in a lot of ways. This is just wonderful. Now, this is a buglabs.com? .net. Buglabs.net. Okay, so you have to be careful when you type that in for <laughs> unintended consequences. Buglabs.net. Right. And And uh, what a thrilling product. And I know that our tech podcast audience is just going to find this to be one of the highest rating interviews that we're going to have uh, for CES. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Kick it.